seated. And when you're ready, Mr. Overstreet. Thank you, Rob. <coughs> so before the lunch break, uh, we finished talking about motive. And at this point, I've talked to you about the plan that Nancy had put in place, the knowledge that she had, the opportunity that she had to carry this out. And although motive is not an element and nothing that needs to be proven, we still talked about the motive that Nancy Brophy had to kill Dan. Now defense spent some time in their opening statement, and I'm certain they're going to spend some time in their closing argument, saying, well, that motive is bogus because they had this retirement plan. They weren't in financial trouble. They had this plan moving forward that was going to save them, bring them out of the worst financial situation that they've ever had. Now, what did they tell you about this plan? Well, they said a lot, but what became clear is it's clearly a plan that was concocted for you. This wasn't something that they talked with family and friends about. They maybe mentioned the idea of the thought of selling their house. But remember what Matt Gitchell said about the retirement plan? It was like throwing darts at a map. It was all talk. They just ideas that they had for the future, as most people probably do. Even younger than the Brophies, they talk about their future. But there was no concrete plan, as defense would have you believe. And they point to that to say, well, because of this retirement plan that they have, that means they don't have any financial struggles. And so why would she need to kill Dan? It's really the only thing that defense can point to to say, well, there's no need. But you have to remember, nobody knew about it. They just created this for you. And they pull little bits and pieces Throughout, the, throughout time to show you that this must have been the plan. But the problem with that is Dan clearly had no intentions of retiring, as we very well established. Dan wasn't going along with this plan. Doesn't appear that he knew about any plan that they were retiring. In fact, the only two people that you heard from that mention an actual plan, Dan retiring at 68 or 70, what the plan was moving forward. You heard from two people that told you there was a plan. Do you remember who those were? They were two defense experts. Not friends, not family. Two paid defense experts that got all of their information from the defense. One of them even said, well, I assumed they asked Nancy for this information. That's the only time you heard of an actual plan. What was that plan? Their big plan was they were going to subdivide this property. Now, when I say they're taking little bits and pieces from their history within the past year, let's say, and then they're building a story around it for you. Because they did talk to somebody about the possibility of subdividing the property, right? They talked to Richard Freimark. He testified and said, I'm an old acquaintance of Nancy's. She approached me. She asked me about the possibility of subdividing the property. He had a little bit of information he provided to them and then gave them a list of names. Or I shouldn't say them, Nancy. She, he gave Nancy a list of names. One of those people was Nick White. He was an engineer that could potentially help with the process of subdividing the property. Now, Nancy got on the stand and said, yeah, well, I did talk to Richard Freimark. He gave me a list of names, and I called one of them. I called, she thought, she wasn't sure of the name. When I said the name Nick White, that sounded right to her. Something from KS Engineering, something like that, is what she agreed to. And she said she talked to him about this, consulted with him about the possibility of subdividing the property. Then Nick White came in and talked to you. And Nick White said, never heard of her. Another Nancy lie. He not only never heard of her, 
he said he went back through their records, through their database, to see, had anybody in this company talked to her? Had anybody had a conversation with her? Have they called in? Has there been any communication with this company and the Brophies? And the answer was no. So she takes these pieces, she builds upon them, thinking nobody's going to follow up. Nobody's going to follow up. Yeah, I called and talked to so-and-so. I talked to this person. Don't really remember his name, but we figured it out. And that person came in here and said, that's not true. It's because they got a little bit of information about how to subdivide that property, and it's very difficult. And they abandoned that plan. The reason you know that is because she also talked to her neighbor, sorry, neighbor, Paul Johnston, who's a realtor. And Nancy talked to Paul Johnson about the possibility of subdividing the property like a neighbor did. And Paul told you, I got this sense through this conversation with Nancy that she wasn't interested. No further conversations about subdividing the property. So what are they talking about? They just want you to accept that this is a great plan to subdivide the property. They're going to make a bunch of money and everything's going to be fine. But it's not true. It's based on the premise of a single conversation with Richard Freimark, and everything else is a lie. What else did Nancy lie about in regards to these people? Paul Johnston. She told you, she told you that Dan and Paul Johnston had things in common like the garden. They shared sauces. They had conversations. That Dan and Paul Johnston knew each other, and friendly with each other. Nancy was there for conversations between the two of them. Another lie. Paul Johnston sat up here and said, I had one conversation with Dan. He was the guy who dropped off coffee grounds in my garden. I didn't know who it was. And he came out one day as Dan's driving by, and they have a short conversation. Nancy was nowhere to be found in that conversation. Another lie. Nancy cannot help herself but to develop stories to explain why she does what she does. And if you notice, she sprinkles those lies among people. It's not just the things that we've covered. Think about the things that she's told people. She chooses who she tells certain things to so that they have bits of information, but she's never forthcoming. Right in line with what Dr. Warford said. Dr. Warford, although she opined that Nancy was forthcoming, she said that, she then later says in the same evaluation that Nancy Brophy won't even admit her shortcomings, basic shortcomings. Nancy wants to always look good. She wants the relationship to always look good. So of course everybody on the outside when talking to Nancy goes, they appeared to have a wonderful relationship. Because that's what Nancy made sure they knew. As I said before, you can look throughout this trial and you can point to many lies perpetrated by Nancy Brophy. Just like when she told you she always goes to Vernonia, and that turns out not to be true. And that was part of the retirement plan as well. Nancy Brophy, the reality is she was not planning a retirement <laughs> in early 2018. She was planning a murder. Retirement was not what she had plans for with Dan Brophy. She might have had her own retirement plans after the murder was carried out, but nothing with Mr. Brophy. When you go back to June 2nd and think about what happened and think about the stories that Nancy has told, just look at that timeline and look at that black bar right in the middle of the timeline heading from left to right. That's the time that Nancy doesn't remember, so she says. That morning she gets up in a scene on video driving around downtown. She doesn't remember that. She drives back home. She's seen by the neighbors. She doesn't remember that. All the way up to the point, of course, when she remembers the call from Maxine Borgerding, which again, inconsequential facts. That's why she's able to remember them. Nancy suffers not from retrograde amnesia or enterograde amnesia. Nancy suffers from convenient amnesia. She doesn't remember the things that she doesn't want to tell you about. Whenever it's convenient for her, that's what she doesn't remember. 
But what does she remember? All the non-critical pieces, very specific. The call from Maxine Borgerding, the call to Dan, the call or the text to Dan, the calls back and forth to Maxine Borgerding, the calls to Karen Brophy and the contents of that call. She remembers getting dressed. She remembers getting in her car. She remembers driving to the Culinary Institute. She remembers white knuckling the steering wheel. She remembers playing with the radio. She remembers parking. She remembers talking to police officers. She remembers being walked into the tape. She remembers talking to detectives. She remembers being interviewed by detectives. She remembers talking to a tips volunteer and what that content was. She remembers talking to detectives further. She remembers driving back home with the detectives driving her home in order for her to give a gun to the detectives. That is not the murder weapon. She remembers all of that, but nothing at a critical moment. Nancy murdered Dan Brophy on a day he would be alone, in a place where there are no cameras, in a place that would pay the most money upon his death. No one else had the knowledge that Nancy Brophy had. No one else had the plan that Nancy Brophy had, nor the opportunity, and certainly not the motive. Nancy Brophy possessed all of those. And upon the conclusion of these arguments, we are going to be asking you to re return a verdict of guilty for the murder of Dan Brophy. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Overstreet. Uh, defense, do you need a moment to set up? For, we should. Uh, five minutes? Sure. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm asking. I don't know. How. <laughs> if it works for okay, we let's, yeah. let's Let's yeah. plan on taking a 10-minute break, and then we'll hear the defense closing. Thank okay, you. We'll go on